And that Caribbean glow is real too. We came for the adventure, we mm -hmm. stayed for the life. I don't see myself moving back. We go over to the beach and she's like, yeah, we're not going anywhere. Exactly. Throughout all the years that I have been here, I know for a fact that that is not gonna change. I don't want my brain picked. That sounds right. painful. I don't want people to get trapped in the idea that Hi, and welcome to the Punta Cana podcast. My name is Cheryl Henderson, your guide to Punta Cana living. And today we are celebrating our 20th episode of the Punta Cana podcast. And I cannot be happier to welcome our very special guest, none other than the Jamie Gruber. Great to be here. It's Great. a lot of pressure. <laughs> no, this is so special. <laughs> Yes! There's balloons. There's a whole bunch going on. We are celebrating. We are celebrating because <laughs> I understand there's a statistic that like 99.9% .9 of the podcast don't get to 20. So to me, it's like, woo! It's so true. It's 99%. Have... Literally 99% don't make it past episode 20. So yeah. congrats to you. So Congrats. here we are. Let's hope we make it to the next one. <laughs> You'll be good. You'll be good. I'll do my best. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jamie. So you're an expat living here in Punta Cana. Tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a, a recovering corporate guy. I started with a big company called Progressive Insurance in the United States in the year 2000 as a claims adjuster, which is nobody's dream. Nobody dreams about growing up to work in the insurance industry, but I was pretty good at it. So I started to move up the chain pretty quickly. Eventually it moved me to Boston. I met my wife there who's Dominican. She grew up in Igwe, uh, hence the connection here to the Dominican Republic. Right. We can dive into that. And later on, eventually got what I called my dream job, which was an executive level position. It moved me to uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan area. Uh, and as soon as I got there, very shortly after, I, you know, I kind of realized this is about 17 years into what ended up being a 21 year career that yeah, this isn't for me. So I got the big income, the big office, the big salary, everything that I, I thought I wanted. And I was kind of miserable. Yes. So I went through about a year, year and a half of sleepless nights. What am I going to do? My wife doesn't work. I have two boys at the, well, one and one on the way at that point. How am I going to replace a $400,000 annual income? I'm so embedded. Wow. So real estate investing became interesting to me. I started doing a little of that. I enjoyed it. In that became sort of a awareness of what it is to have a personal brand, a podcast and so on. Mm. So I kind of dove into that in conjunction with the real estate investing and has expanded it over time. And in 2021, I felt, uh, I guess, confident enough uh, to quit. I left the job, left a lot of equity behind because I was an equity level executive. And I just said, it's enough. And a year later, with the vision in mind of, you know, at some point, I'd love to go somewhere for like three plus months with my family. I want that kind of flexibility. Yes. My wife and I decided we're going to do it here. So we came for a year. It's been two. We just committed to our third year. So I think wow. we've got that that bug of like, I came for a week and never left. Kind of, it, it, we're in the That's middle. That's how of it happens. Right that, 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 I, there's so many people with that story. And I love to hear those kind of stories because you think that it's really rare that people will come to the Dominican Republic or to Punta Cana and make that decision yeah. so quickly. And it can happen. For me, I came on vacation and then I was here full time six months later. Sure. Literally, I came here and I thought, oh my gosh, I, I really feel at home here. So you left corporate America, you left a very good job, mm -hmm. tons and tons of money, a lot of security, but you were not happy. Yeah. And you kind of went through that and processed that for a while. What was it like at that point when you actually made the decision. I mean, it seems like it took you a little bit of time, but what really yeah. helped you to just say, this is it? You know, it's interesting. My, when in COVID, I'm in Michigan, it's cold. So at a, at a point, uh, nobody's in offices. My wife and I said, you know what, let's go somewhere warm for a month. It was February of 2021. So we decided to go to Florida, South Florida specifically. My wife and kids, they flew nice and comfortably. I drove a minivan with toys and dogs and all of that for three days from Michigan down to South Florida. And on the trip, my mind started going on the possibility of leaving. By this time, I was 
uh, starting to gain a little bit of momentum in my side hustles, in my brand, in my real estate investing. Not to the point where I was replacing 400 grand, but doing okay. And mm -hmm. I could see the path out, even if it was maybe having a little bit of a reliance on savings if yes. I needed to. Yes. So my mind is going through all of this for the you know two, three days of the drive. And about two hours before my final arrival in Hollywood, Florida, I get a call from a guy that I worked with in Boston. And I don't talk to this guy. Nice guy, but you know he was a coworker. That mm -hmm. was it. And I hadn't worked in Boston for four years. So weird to get a call from him, weird to get it on a Saturday, and I pick up. His name was Bob. He's like, hey, uh, it's Bob. I wanted to give you a call because I know you, know you were close to him. He was a friend of yours. But Paul, who was a, another guy I worked with, a few years older than me, had two young boys. We had similar personalities, similar styles or whatever. He said, I wanted to let you know Paul went into the hospital with some chest pains last night, and oh. he never came out. Oh. So that moment, uh, man, it still hits me. That moment, I could sort of see Paul almost in the rearview mirror. Wow. You know, I, could, I connected with him in that moment. And here's a guy that, I mean, I knew him. He was a friend. He wasn't like a best friend. We didn't talk all the time, but knew him enough where for some reason that moment hit me and it said, I think I'm done. Yeah. So I got to Florida. I spent my month there, you know, worked it out with my wife, who was very supportive. And once I got back a month later to uh, Michigan, I walked in and gave my, my one month notice. So wow. That's how it happened. Wow. So it's like things kind of lined up for you. You you weren't really that happy, but they, they called it like the golden handcuffs. I mean, I, I worked in corporate America, yeah. not quite as long as you for like six years, but it was a little tough even leaving at that stage. I, I was doing really well. Yeah. I actually really loved loved my job, but my husband at the time was like, no, you know, come work with me, do something different. And he, he kind of pulled and I'm, I'm glad that he did, but it's really hard to leave those jobs because you feel like you're leaving security. Oh, big time. And for me, the, the role I was in every year, I would get a stock award, 50, $60,000 of mm -hmm. a stock award, yeah. uh, which would vest over time, but there was always an amount that's unvested. So the unvested amount that if I had stayed another 12 or 13 years was probably, I don't know, five, six, $700,000. So mm -hmm. I just walked from that. So you're yeah. talking about golden handcuffs sort of in uh, on top of it, you know, like yeah. it's major golden handcuffs. It's always like that, always. right? It's like, yes. oh, this is what I have. This is yeah. what I can have. This I need to stay, and you know, even the timing <laughs> when I left, I left in March and had I stayed to the end of the year, I would have vested another, I don't know, $200,000 in equity and I would have had another $90,000 bonus yeah. just to stay nine more months. Yeah, I just couldn't. I yeah. couldn't do it. So yeah. It was just time. I just knew something, whatever, God, source, the universe, something was just delivering yeah. a message. It was like, it's time to go. It's time and, to go. And I'm sure having three days of quiet time to just think, you know, when you have a family and yeah. children, sometimes you don't really get that time to just think I do and that. like connect with yourself. I do that intentionally as a result of that now. So that trip, Look at to that. your point, released something I call a solo weekend because yeah, you're busy, right? Work, kids, family, all of that stuff. There's no time just to kind of decompress, detox the brain. And, and think a little bit or, yeah. or feel into it. So yeah, once a quarter, once every six months or so, I'll go to like four points, which mm -hmm. is literally up the street from my house. Yeah. I'll walk there on a Friday. I'll stay there till Sunday night. I check, I have the checkout on Monday, even if I leave and go home Sunday night, but really three full days of quiet time with intention. My intention on my last one was like, what is it that's holding me back from being the best version of myself? And I just wow. allow myself to meditate, journal a bit and just let the noise of everything that's happening in life kind of dissipate and really hear more of what's going on inside. That is really incredible. Like yeah. more of us should do that. Look, long weekend and not necessarily with friends no, and solo. partying. Has just, to be solo. To spend that time alone to just listen to your thoughts, yeah. to communicate with yourself yep. and ask those questions. You, more of us should do that. I, I mean, I should do that. I'm making a commitment here <laughs> in front of the whole world. You know what? I'm going to do that. Yeah. And I, one of actually my top agent in um, one of my companies, a real estate company, Keller Williams, he takes a trip every quarter. Smart. He literally gets on a plane and just escapes every quarter. And I know that this is a key to his success. And we try to do that even with our team to do these kind of things and think about getting away but it's nice to spend that quiet time to think and to really figure out where you are in life to make some of those decisions because yeah. sometimes we get in this rut this rat race and there's no time and then all of a sudden 20 years pass 30 years pass or we look at our kids it's like when did they grow up yeah well it's it's nice yes I, I even say it's essential I can't think of a time that I've taken any amount of time alone and it has not benefited me wow. I look at it like uh, almost like eating 
Like if all you did was eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, and eat right? Like th it's not possible. Your body can't deal with that. Mm -hmm. But we ingest mm -hmm. all the time. We ingest yeah. information, problems, challenges, you know, mm -hmm. meetings. We just ingest, ingest, ingest. Mm -hmm. But you need time for your body to digest food. You need time for your mind and your body to digest information and digest life a little bit. So once a quarter to spend mm -hmm. a day, two, three days on your own with some intention, mm -hmm. I, whoever's doing that in your business, uh, the person that's doing that, that's the, the smartest thing you can he do to is, accelerate it. Yeah. He, he's a rock star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he is a literal machine. And I, I really know that that has something to do with it 100%. because you just don't get all the way bogged down yeah. you kind of refresh and rejuvenate so i think that is really really incredible and it's something that maybe is not so easy to do when you're in corporate america because you kind of sacrifice yourself right sure. 100%. even even with the family so now you made that decision you had this epiphany on the trip this phone call mm -hmm. that just kind of was like a wake-up call it seems 100%. like and decide and then also imagine COVID with time yeah. There are so many things that have happened with COVID. There, there are so many COVID stories, you know. It was such a shift in the world that it really shifted everything. And, and many, many people have come out totally different, you it know. Just, it shifted the what's important. Yes. You know, like I think now the pursuit before for me was always security, money, status, mm -hmm. all of that, yeah. right? Like, any, well, like anybody Normal does. Stuff. Not saying that no, I don't have those pursuits now. Of course, I want security for my family. Everybody enjoys status. I mean, significance is a human need. Yes. But happiness, happiness is sort of elevated to the top of all of that. So as I make decisions on a week to week, month to month basis, often what I try to do is filter it through like, will this make me happy? So mm -hmm. for instance, coming to this, when, when the invitation, however, started to come to do this, that's a full body yes. Okay. This is cool, this is fun, right? Come and meet somebody that's really interesting, the billboard lady, I see you everywhere. <laughs> so meet this person who I see everywhere and do something that I enjoy doing, which is create content, have a conversation. This sort of thing is a, is a, a yes, because it makes me happy. Mm -hmm. No one's paying me to be here. Mm -hmm. I'm not making income for being here, mm -hmm. but it makes me happy. So yes. I think COVID shifted priorities for people in the best possible way. If you want to look at the silver lining on COVID, I think that's what it was. Yes, I, I do agree with you. Yeah. I do agree with you. These are some of the top reasons you should stay at Hotel Las Flores in Punta Cana. The beach, that's one of the Nick names for the wellness area here at Hotel Las Flores. This is where you can enjoy yoga, meditation, and all types of feel-good activities. Namaste. I love the water. And here at Hotel Las Flores, we have a prosperity fountain. This is where you can come and attract abundance. And I love the way Christopher makes the cocktails. Pina Colada is my favorite. I mean, look at this. The flowers, the garden, the pool, the tropical ambience. Need I say more? You can get relaxation and holistic massages with Nati. The beds are so comfortable. You sleep like a baby. <sighs> And the views are spectacular. We'll see you soon at Las Flores Hotel in Punta Cana. Tell me about your transition here. So you came for a month? No, oh, a year. A year. Yeah, well, yeah, yes. Our intention was a year. Okay, so you decided, okay, let's move to the Dominican Republic. Had you been here? I imagine you had been here before since your wife is from here. Yeah. What went through your mind when you actually thought, okay, I'm leaving the United States to move to the Dominican Republic? You know, most people don't associate the Dominican Republic with safety, but we found that it's safer here. So all of these things we learned along the way, like we came for the adventure, we mm -hmm. stayed for the life, for the lifestyle, for what it provides our family, truly. I, we feel like our kids are a little bit less, I don't know, restricted here. Mm -hmm. They can go and be and do the stories you and I would have growing up. Like right. I disappeared at 7 a.m. and I came back at 9 p.m. or whatever, right? Those stories exist here still. Right. So for and us- And how old are your children? Nine, they're now nine and six. They okay. just turned nine and six this so past young, month. So young kids. Young boys, yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, so, so the move for us wasn't too scary because we did it in a chunk. We did it in a bite-sized mm -hmm. way. So somebody might say, I'm gonna move for three months or I'm gonna go for six months or something mm -hmm. like that. That's way easier than, oh my God, I'm moving for a lifetime. 
Mm -hmm. But the moment that we decided we were here for a month, to your point earlier that you said, we did come for a month first, which was January of 2022. Not with the intention of, hey, let's go check it out mm -hmm. and see if we want to move there. But while here, that's when we decided, you know what, we're going to move here for okay. a year. We went uh, two weeks on a resort kind of around town. Two weeks we went to Iguay to my wife's family. And what that allowed me to do was, as a guy who'd never lived here but had been coming here many, many times over 15 mm -hmm. years of my, my marriage, I, it allowed me to actually, for the first time, just sort of be a resident. Mm -hmm. I got, I went to the gym, I went to the grocery store, I drove a car. I'd never done that in the 15 years that I had been coming here. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden it felt like I had a routine here. I could see myself living here. And then watching my sons, my two boys who did not speak Spanish at the time, playing with their little cousins in Igwe, who only spoke Spanish, somehow interacting, which is really cool for kids, right? It is cool. Somehow interacting, we thought, ooh, how cool would it be? for them to get this experience, get the language skills, get the culture. So those factors, it, was, it wasn't like a she convinced me, I convinced her. Uh, my wife and I kind of looked at each other and said, yeah, yeah, let's, let's do this for a while. So again, a year was the intention, but um, we just paid for school tuition for the third year, so we're here for a while. <laughs> awesome, that is incredible. And I think there's some information that we can glean out of this for, for anybody who may be thinking to move because it's actually similar to what happened with me too. Yeah. I actually moved, but I always remember that my mom would tell me, I still have your bedroom. If anything goes wrong, you can come back home. So it's not as daunting if you know, okay, it's just for a short amount of time or it's not permanent because you never know. I mean, it's enough to move from one city to one city or from one state to another or even to to change jobs. I mean, any change can be kind of daunting and to move to a foreign country where you don't speak the language, right, and you, right. don't, you have your children to think about. I had a four year old and it's like, okay, let's just see how this goes. Yeah. And I, you know, I had the same idea. It's like, let's see how it goes. I, I didn't even have a time period. I was just like, I'm going to move. I'm going to see what I can do. If it doesn't work, I'll go back home. <laughs> when did it become no longer am I going back home? How long? like maybe 10 years, 10 years. <laughs> no, I don't. when I first moved here it was really for an adventure mm -hmm. because I tell my story I'm an army brat and that's how it was like hey move to a different place no big deal adapt and uh, it was kind of challenging it was rough I mean now looking back it's funny you asked me the question but looking back I don't even know if I would have done it the same way I think that I didn't know what I didn't know, yeah. but I was open to an adventure. And there were some rough times. I mean, it was, there was definitely not what it is today. Oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> there, I, there I started were, coming in 08, 09. Yeah. And it, it's half of what it is. I can't imagine when you came. Dirt, like dirt roads <laughs> and really literally dirt roads and we couldn't get service and inconsistent water. Sometimes I had to shower with a bucket. I was okay with that. Nowadays, it doesn't ever happen anymore. But there were times when I was like, do I stay? Do I go? Do I stay? Do I go? And I always thought to myself, well, if I go, where would I go? And what would I do? Mm. And it was always like, you know what? I might as well just stay here. Yeah. And, and it, that went on for, for quite a while because me being an army brat, I'm used to moving. So I was always like, you know, I can move and go somewhere else. So it wasn't like um, I had lived somewhere all my life and then I moved here. It was like maybe there, there's another stop That's on so my journey. We're in that mode now. You mentioned about, you know, kind of keeping a, a foot on first base mm -hmm. in the United States. We did that. We have our house. We can go back to Do Michigan. you still have it? We still own it. We still rent it out. All of that. Okay. But we're going back for six weeks in the summer. And part of that is sort of a decision. Is it time to burn the boats? Is yeah. it time to say, you know what? We're here for a while. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I have moved a lot. Neither of us would say forever. We yeah. wouldn't say forever to anywhere. You never know. Correct. But, you know, we have our kids. What does high school look like? We, who knows? Yeah. But at least for the foreseeable future, the next number of years, we're kind of coming to this point of like, I don't see us going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I really don't. You know, my mm -hmm. wife gets more frustrated than I do with some of the stuff locally. She speaks Spanish. So dealing with the banks, dealing mm -hmm. with the government agencies, like it can be, you know, it can yeah. be daunting. It can be a challenge. Right. So for her, it's like, that's her frustration. But then we go over to the beach and she's like, yeah, we're not going anywhere. Exactly. So now it's a question of, do we burn our boats? Do we sell our house in the States? Do we buy down here for our permanent residency? Like we're looking at buying uh, investment property here for sure. But uh, that, that uh, I don't know if you know anybody that sells real estate here. Well, I don't know. I might, I might have to look into that and make a recommendation. <laughs> but here's a question for you. When's the last time you almost moved back to the States? It has been a while. <laughs> it, has been, it has been quite a while. And what I will tell you is 
I actually feel more comfortable here. Yeah. And I don't see myself moving back. I really don't anymore because it's just so comfortable here. I, I mean, really, the, the, a lot of the inconveniences that I experienced when I first moved here are no longer here. And like, there's Starbucks now. So let yeah. me just say that, everybody, there is Starbucks. And it took a lot of years. You know, I am I have some roots back in the Pacific Northwest and Tacoma, Seattle, yeah. and that's the coffee capital. Sure. Yeah, so for a long time, there was always this short list of things that I missed. Like in the beginning, it was soap, like my favorite soap. Sure. And now they sell it in the stores or, or going to a restaurant and getting a good steak because you know here you get great chicken and great seafood but sometimes I would miss a steak or or shopping for example different little things throughout the years and I went just checking things off the list and now there is no list mm. there's literally nothing else that is left on the list especially yeah. now that Starbucks is here because I used to it's crazy but you know if you you know I like the coffee here in the Dominican Republic but that was the one thing that I would do when I would go back to the states is get a Starbucks the only thing not that I craved it but it was like hey let's go over there and now there's literally nothing at all oh, I have one I'll share it in what a is moment. it I'll share it in a moment but I think there's <laughs> nothing wrong and this is, I think something that people people get a little a little nutty about sometimes there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that you have American roots whether you're Dominican American or American American like you and I are Be Starbucks is fine right it's okay to oh, want yeah. Starbucks right? I don't like, apologize exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, mean, so I am who I am <laughs> there's one brand that if they came I would absolutely that would check my last box and that would be Chick-fil-a <sighs> Yes, we are waiting for Chick-fil-A. <laughs> you know, I, it's it's not something that I get off the plane and run to. Oh, I do. I but do. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's always something. I mean, for, for literally, if they are in the airport, I will get it. Even to bring it on the plane and give it to my older son, who's 22. He loves Chick-fil-A. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm taking some Chick-fil-A. But yes, I totally agree with you. But let me tell you something. Having been here for over 18 years and seeing everything that I have seen, they will get it's here. It's inevitable. They will have to. Yeah. Punta Cana is growing. It's on the up and up. There will be nothing that will be missing for us. So let's just say that thought word deed, Chick-fil-A is on the way. Chick-fil-A, guys, listen. Let's go. Let's Punta Cana, Dominican Republic, we want to see you here. Hi, are you a U.S. veteran looking for a change for the better? If so, join us on our monthly tours to Punta Cana for veterans. We have lots in store for you. Click the link in the description. Now, back to the episode. So I'm part of this uh, networking group in the States and I pay $10,000, $12,000 a year to be a member of this group because it's a bunch of, in this case, male entrepreneurs. We get together and we're able to share some things vulnerably uh, that maybe you can't with your regular network of friends. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a little bit of a, especially in the corporate world, there's a little bit of guardedness. Vulnerability isn't, it isn't the first order when you're talking to other like neighbors and people yeah, in the States. Yeah, that's normal. So I pay all this money to be part of this group. Then I move here and you know, I go to the soccer field with my kids and there's other dads there. And here, I've said this, I believe entrepreneurship or that hustle or that need to figure out, figure out ways to do it in the country in general. It's not a uh, cool Instagram thing, like look at me entrepreneur with my Bugatti, it's survival. Like mm -hmm. even the kid who's selling you cashews at the toll booth or mm -hmm. washing your window, like that, that entrepreneurial hustle, it's survival here. So when I interact with dads of, mm -hmm. my ki of other kids that were at the soccer field or whatever, I'm able to have those same deep, meaningful, non-judgmental type of conversations that I pay ten, twelve thousand dollars a year to have in the United States. So to your point about being comfortable here, I've been amazed. And again, this isn't why I moved here. I moved here like be everybody else would. Beaches, beautiful. Oh, it'd be oh, so yeah. cool. The palm trees. I moved here for the pictures. But I'm staying because I'm able to meet, or I have been able to meet the kind of people that I'm able to surround myself with that actually help me become better, that I'm, a, I'm able to kind of like share some of the burdens of life with without fear of being judged mm -hmm. or talked about behind my back or gossiped about. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you, the comfort level here for me, uh, it's, it's in all these, different, all these different areas and that was the one that was most surprising. Like, wow, these guys, I can actually interact with these guys, it's nice. So let's peel that back a bit. Sure. Where do you think that comes from? I mean, what what do you think is the source of that? Is it the people who are here? Is it the environment? Like, how does that happen that it, it did not happen in the United States, but it happens naturally here? This is just my theory. But I think environmentally, this is one of the differences between the states and here that I've felt. So you're asking essentially, what is it about the ability to interact kind of vulnerably with people here that doesn't exist in the United States? 
In the United States, the society has, in my opinion, and I think most would agree, has sort of started to separate into this left-right. So on one side, there's a person that's the savior. It's Trump. Without Trump, the world won't go on. Everything will be terrible. And everybody aligns under that that's on that side of it. Or there's Biden or whoever on the left, right? And everybody, I'm, I'm doing the wrong hands here, but the left, I was over here on my right hand. Um, but everybody aligns under Biden. And so let's take an issue like abortion. Mm -hmm. So if somebody says I'm pro-life, mm -hmm. then immediately these two buckets of people mm -hmm. throw all of whatever else they associate with mm -hmm. pro-life and Trump, and they say you're all of those things, mm -hmm. and immediately vilify you for being one side or the other. Or they think you're just like them and you're aligned with them. Mm -hmm. We can't just have a discussion on the issue mm -hmm. and then understand that on the next issue, whatever I say might align more with the left than the right or the right mm -hmm. with the left. I think one of the, oh, this is a weird way to put it. I think one of the sort of benefits of a, a government here that is, you don't have left, right, you have people government. So in my opinion, there's not like I align under this political leader, I align under this, this political leader and let's shout at each other from each side. And you have to be careful what you say and you have mm -hmm. to qualify it and everything else, cancel. Here, people are just simply aligned with each other as mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. We can have a conversation about yes. an issue. We can talk about whether or not the Doña Pula statue. See, I'm trying not to be offensive. A midget, a little person, a dwarf, she was a little person, apparently one, once upon a time. Um, and ah, uh, That's why, because it, right. it is kind of, but anyway, that giant statue is ridiculous. So we can have that conversation and it won't be like, oh, you must be this or you must be that. We have the discussion. Yes. We agree, disagree, discussion over. But yes. you and I can have a drink. Yes. You and I can still exist as people here. Yes. What we don't want is we don't want the government. We don't trust the government to come in. And we shouldn't in the United States to right. come in and do, do what they're going to do with us. We don't want their intervention here. Right. right? Like, so people are aligned as human beings. Mm. They're willing to have discussions on issues without mm. making the person a checklist bucket left or checklist bucket right individual mm -hmm. who's aligned with Trump or Biden or whomever it might be. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if there's a distrust, if there's something that they rail against, it's the government. Police corruption, somebody pulling me over and shaking me down for 500 pesos, right? Like, we all agree on that. We're not like, well, I'm on the right, so police corruption is good. I'm on the left, police corruption is bad, and you must be all these things. So I think societally here, something they've figured out or maybe haven't been dragged into yet, and I hope never do, they never do, is the politics of left and right. I don't mm -hmm. think that exists. I mean, there's differences of, of opinion, but it's on the issue. So that's why. Right. The second thing is what I mentioned before. I just think that for, like, I talk to so many people here, like, what do you do? And everyone does everything or can or is capable of or is connected to somebody that knows how to. I'm doing a, a podcast where I do it in restaurants. Susan, who's sitting over there, just gave me like 20 different restaurant owners names. She knows everybody. Yes. Like that kind of connectedness, that sort of uh, ability to know who's doing what, who's doing where. And you know, I get WhatsApps from my doctor. I don't know. You haven't been in the States in a while. You don't text your doctor in the That's United true. States. You yeah. just don't. That's like a, ah. But the doctor is a parent at the school. Correct. You know what I mean? That's, that's You see each other and your kids are yep. in judo together. Going to school. It's a community. Our, our teachers at school are aligned with us on sort of like, let's both sit on this side of the table and figure out the best plan yes. for our kids. Whereas in the States, you're dealing with teachers, unions, boards of education, lesson plans, you know, whatever's coming down from three years ago that the U.S. Board of Education kind of said, all of you need to do. So there's just an alignment of values around uh, for people here, I believe. And I think the the spirit of connectedness still exists. People stop by here. Yes. They don't have to schedule it. They just stop by. It could be annoying sometimes, but they just stop by, right? Yes. Like that, I have company. Pull out the cake. Somebody's here. That's great. So that culture still exists here. And I think that's what kind of creates, you know, what we were talking about. I think that's wonderful. And I completely agree with you. And what I call that is community. Yeah. And I love that because we are building a community. We are a part of the community and we all do our part to help the community to grow. I mean, that's a part of the safety conversation, too. When people ask me about safety, I'm like, everybody's here. We're, you know, we all want to live a good life and hang out and go to the beach and work and do our jobs, even, you know, on all pay scales, on all levels. Even the people who have the, let's say, menial jobs, they're happy to wake up in the morning because the sun is shining. There's not like some bitterness or somebody to blame. It's just happy to be alive and happy to be neighborly and hello, how are you? And that culture is so strong here. It, despite everything that has changed throughout all the years that I have been here, I know for a fact that that is not gonna change. I do get asked that sometimes. Do you think it's too much development? Is it too much of this? Is it gonna change? 
how the country is. And I'm like, the culture is stronger than anything. That is the one thing that will not change. And I'm very sure about that. And um, I know that people who come here who don't resonate with that, they don't stay generally. I've seen a lot of people come and go over the years and I've seen people come and stay. That's and a so, great point. Yeah. If you think about like Austin, Texas has been sort of San Franciscoized in mm -hmm. some ways, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's a, it's the city in the middle of this state that's always had this value. People from San Francisco are feeling like it's crazy here. You know, mm -hmm. the, the politics, whatever, they move to Austin and they embed those same policies yes. and politics in that community. You can't do that here. You cannot do that. <laughs> that the culture yeah. is gonna, so strong yeah. that, you know, not one person, not one entity. I don't believe that can happen here. I mean, I, I see the, the good of this country even better mm -hmm. every day. I feel more and more comfortable here every day and more and more like this is home, which is why I'm doing this and why you're doing what you're doing. Sure, so sure. what you're doing is you have a, a social media, yeah. you do a podcast, you have Instagram and you talk about out the Dominican Republic, living here. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, it's interesting because it wasn't the intent. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the intent to be sort of known as this guy in, in the Dominican Republic. I've always shared my story. I enjoy creating. So, you know, you asked at the beginning, like, hey, what should we put under your name? I said, entrepreneur could be creator. I just enjoy yeah. creating content, right? So I've been doing it for a long time at different phases of my journey. When I started investing in real estate, I would share, hey, this is what I'm doing in real estate. And some people followed. When I started to go down the path of quitting my job, I shared that and some more people followed. Like, oh, that's interesting, you quit his job. When I talked about being able to travel or move abroad or do something as an expat, yeah, I talked about it, I shared it, and some people followed. When I said, hey, Dominican Republic is where I went, it's pretty cool, everybody followed. That was wow. the, that was the, be, it was sort of like, wow, okay, well, I guess people are interested in this, and I'm just sharing my story. So when people ask me, like, what's your angle? I'm like, I don't really have one. I just have been sharing my story, and this has resonated with a lot of people, so I'll continue to share that story. I just like adding value to others. So, yeah, it started with Instagram. It's blown up uh, at this point as we sit here in June of 2024. I'm like, I don't know, 80-ish thousands uh, followers. Wow. Which is great. But the, the, the better part of that for me is the, not even the views. It, my, my, my videos usually get between, I don't know, 40 and 100,000 views each time. But it's the shares. They're being shared 800, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 times, which to me means, okay, this is valuable to people. So my metric on Instagram that lets me know if I'm doing a good job as a creator is do people want to share it? So they do. That led to, well, there's a lot of little bite-sized chunks that I'm doing a minute at a time on Instagram. Maybe I could string together a little bit more coherent thoughts in longer form and go over to YouTube. And so I did about two months ago, and that's grown. We've gotten up to about 12,000 subscribers, and we've got a lot of the metrics we want there are doing really well. But it's just taking those bite-sized chunks of discussion points. What's Amazon like in the Dominican Republic? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the best beaches to go to? All these little things I do in a minute taking those and expanding on them, giving more context, more detail. And to be honest with you, a lot of what I do, and this is maybe just me being defensive, is I'm learning how there's some media bias, some negativity sometimes around this country. Just headlines that sort of tell the story that's not real. So I kind of clap back. But that's media. That. that is media. We, we know how the media is the media. Yeah, it's it's to gotta be place. dramatic. Yes. It's It's gotta uh, like create fear. Yeah. And that's what people want, drama, fear. And that, that's, that's, that's the me media. Nuts. So I push back on that a lot. And obviously it drives a lot of people nuts because a lot of people that they follow and resonate with that content. So yeah, so right now for me, it's I'm enjoying the process of creating. My income streams come from businesses I have in the United States. And now I'm at this point of like, well, there's a lot of opportunity here for me, given that I've, I've built, a, I think, a trusted brand. Mm -hmm. So how do I leverage that and or serve others? So like, I'm not, I my whole thing in anything in business, like I don't want to force anything. I want to be begged for it. And that sounds really egotistical. I don't mean it to be. But what I mean is, I don't want to say, oh, I want to partner with this brand because I can make money off of it. I want to say, well, what does my audience need? They want to know what rental car company to use. They want to know what realtors to use. They want to know what short-term rental companies to use. That's the influx of demand that I have. And mm -hmm. honestly, uh, initially I was like, I I don't want to be responsible for who you use in these different areas, but I'm learning. It's like, actually, these folks are, this is the need that they yes. have. So on the brand side, my it's, next it's level. It's really helping it, them. Helping. Yep. Yes. So on the brand side, my next level is going through and understand, okay, what do I use? And do I love it? And can I partner with those brands to, you know, who's the rental car company use? What airline do I use? Those sorts of things. Can I partner with those brands to give value to my audience? And then, yeah, for real estate or for short-term rental management companies, who are the people that I can trust to refer folks that are looking for somebody that can help them here? Because there's a lot of, 
a lot of games realtors play. There's a lot of things that happen uh, in country that I think are the minority, but mm -hmm. they get all the attention. So yes. people on the outside, they want to know like, who can I trust? Yes. This bald dude seems to be somewhat trustworthy. Who do you trust? And I try to share that with people. Mm -hmm. That is incredible. <laughs>
private school alone, the one we go to, which is kind of mid-tier from a pricing standpoint, is about 8,000 a kid a year. So if you do that, we pay it in full up front for the year because it's a little less. But if you do that monthly, what is that? $1,500 a month for two kids right. to go to school? Yeah, at least. $4,000 in mm -hmm. rent. If you get a mortgage on a house in the village, it's eight, nine hundred thousand dollars You're going to probably spend four, five thousand dollars in a mortgage. So it adds up fast, depending on where you decide to live. So my whole point is simply this. Whatever your lifestyle is there in the United States, if you're deciding to move here, if you're thinking about moving here, and you want a similar lifestyle in Punta Cana, you may find that the cost of living isn't far off from what you're paying now. However, what you get for the money, mm -hmm. to me, is exponentially more. The quality of home, the quality of neighborhood, the people that we talked about, the mm -hmm. culture, beaches that people save their entire year to go to yeah. for a week, you go to whenever you want to. Help in the home. Right. Like, we don't cook. We don't clean. We don't do laundry. It has improved our marriage. I mean, those are the things that, uh, that people fight about. Like, mm -hmm. you didn't take the trash out. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. I'm tired. It's been a long day. Couples fight over this. Mm -hmm. Done. We don't have to do any of it. Right. Our, our, uh, the lady who's a housekeeper babysits our kids, so we have date nights every week. We can afford to do that here. So the, the dollar goes way further, yes. but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to move here, spend $1,000, and live like a king. What I typically find, the people that dispute me on that and say, oh my God, in DR, $2,000, you can live like a king. They're either somebody who's quoting somebody whose family lives in Mocha, not in Punta Cana, or they are citing a price from 2008 that just doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. So can you? Sure. Like a king? No. That's my take on cost of living here. Like it's, it'll cost you if you want to be able to just go to Starbucks. If you want to go to a restaurant and not yeah. look at the right side of the menu, if that's the lifestyle you want, it'll cost you more than you might think. I'm not saying it's, it's oppressively uh, mm -hmm. costly, and it may be less depending on where you are in the United States than what you're paying right now, but it's not a $2,000 a month lifestyle, not with a family of four. That's the, right. one, the other qualifier. Not with a yeah. family with kids. It's more expensive than that. So that's always my take on cost of living. And again, qualifying it, you can live cheap. Absolutely. Go mm -hmm. to Pueblo Bavaro. You can live in Pueblo Bavaro for very inexpensive. But motorcycles, bars on windows, loud at night, no noise ordinances, like it will be more what you consider traditional Dominican living than the westernized living that you might be used to if you're moving here uh, and looking for that lifestyle. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. You're the 18-year vet. Yeah. You have, if anybody can tell me where I'm wrong. Yeah, no, 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 you're, you're right. I mean, I pay a lot of money for the school. I would not cut that short for anything. I mean, in the beginning, I remember when, when I was able to have enough money to pay for the school, it was like, whoo, yeah. I can go out and have a steak that, that night. It's like rice and beans. And, you know, because I came here to work sure. and, and that was my idea. I'm going to come here to work and have that lifestyle that people work all year to come and spend a week. Yeah. I'm going to spend all year and have it right here with me, but I'm working. Yeah, yeah I, I, would, I would agree with you in many ways. It depends on, on your lifestyle. 100%. And I always say that yeah. some people come and they buy their home outright. So they don't have a mortgage. That's so right huge. there, that's 4,000 yep. something dollars. You know, your electric bill, you're down there, they have solar here. So there are ways depending but these are people who maybe are they're buying their home so they don't have a mortgage or they're doing other things or maybe they're cooking or maybe they don't need all the services. I do have the services and I love it. Yeah. This is this is one of the reasons I know I'm not moving back That's to the states because <laughs> I, you know, when was the last time I cleaned it's a toilet? I mean, I have not. I don't have to, and yeah. I don't want to, and that's that's just it. I'm it, kind of spoiled in it a way. Makes you, well, spoiled, no. Efficient. Yeah, you're efficient. You're an entrepreneur. I have you're, other things to do correct. with my time. You, your, your time is more valuable than uh, cleaning a toilet. Like, the yeah. even in the States, what is it? What's, what's cleaning a toilet? $10 an hour? $20 an hour type of labor now, maybe, but it's, it's lower cost labor. Yes, so, it is. Yes, right. it is. It so, is. So for you, you can go out. As a realtor, you could sell property, show property, yeah. do things that could earn you a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars in that hour. Same spent. amount of time. Correct. Exactly. So it makes you way more efficient as yes. an entrepreneur, as a business person, being here because of the ability to hire out all those services. Yes. Hundred percent. And I'm very, very happy to do that and pay for those services, and it goes a long way for them. Hundred percent. Like, like yeah. you said, I mean, they're, you know, if their family is in Mocha that you mentioned, which is the other side of the country in the countryside, what they're making is very good money. 
money and yeah. it goes a long way. They don't have electric bills. They don't have mortgage bills. They don't have any of that. I mean, in those towns, they don't even pay for the electricity like yeah. like that. And, and a lot of those services are free. And, and for the food, because it's agricultural, they don't pay for food. So really what the expenses are Very is just low. for You can find it. Luxuries. Go to San Pedro. Go to, go to Santiago. Yeah. I mean, there's places you can live very inexpensively yep. for sure. North Shore, Cabarete, Sosua, yep. Rio San Juan, those great areas, beautiful yep. areas. But if you're choosing Punta Cana, not but, I shouldn't say it that way. If you're choosing Punta Cana, just know that there is a range. There yeah, is there a, is a range. Much there broader is a range. range here. Like yes. you can definitely, if you're a retired couple moving down here, bought your condo or house outright, you can live well on a thousand, two thousand dollars a month. But if you're moving with a family and yes. you're going to have a rent or mortgage or whatever, yes, you, you'll spend more. I just I that don't, is true. I don't want people to get trapped in the idea that Dominican Republic equals two thousand dollar a month living. Like no, yes but not all the time. Yes, so. it, re it really depends. Yeah. So do your research, yeah. do your independent research, reach out, learn what you can from the different groups or talking to people or or even um, watching some of these, these podcasts that have people really telling their stories and talking about their experiences. And then you'll know where you might fit into the spectrum of cost of living. But um, I think it could be very reasonable depending on how you live. I mean, I, I say that too. If you like to go out to restaurants every night, like. I kind of like going out to eat. And my husband, who's Dominican, he likes the rice and chicken and beans every single day. So the lady cooks him rice, chicken and beans every single day. And I may like to go out to a restaurant or it could be business, a meeting and those sure. kind of things. And then those could be more expensive. But yeah. So what other questions do you get? I mean, this is something that, that was very interesting that you have your opinion on. But are there other questions that <laughs> people ask you all the time because you're out there like that? I get a Tell ton. Me. You can go to Instagram, YouTube, see me answer a lot of them. But the one that I get the most is why aren't you tan? Yeah, Jamie, <laughs> why don't you have a tan? Look at you. <laughs> All right, look, number one question. Why are you not tan, Jamie? Here's why. When I step into the sun, I light up in flames. This, <laughs> this pigment doesn't allow for a nice, crispy tan. It doesn't happen. But if I were to stand up right now, and pull some of my pants down. I won't do it. But if I were to and show, I actually do have a tan, tan line. So as pasty as I am, I'm Dominican pasty. It's a little darker than my regular American pasty. But Jamie, but you're one. looking good. Thank you you thank are you. looking good. You have a nice Caribbean glow about you. Like that. And that is a good thing. You do. And yeah. and the smile and everything is just really genuine. I'm going to take that. Yes. I'll take a Caribbean glow. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. It's real. It's real. It's real. <laughs> Island time is real. And that Caribbean glow is real too. So come down here and get your glow. Thank you so much, Jamie. You have dreamed of the perfect Caribbean beach lifestyle. With Boardwalk Developments, we have the blueprint for you in this tropical paradise. Celebrate incredible returns when you elevate your investment portfolio with the hottest real estate in Punta Cana. Invest wisely, live lavishly. We'll show you how. Contact Boardwalk Developments, Punta Cana. As a part of our show, we always take a question from one of our subscribers. Sure. So let's see what we have in store for the you box. today. Yes. I love go it. ahead and oh. pick out one of the questions. I'll in. ask. I go in. There we go. There you go. Okay. It says... Will you be hosting one of your social gatherings for charity in Punta Cana? Yeah, I definitely will. I've done two of these so far. I've done one in Punta Cana, one in Santiago. Um, I got to get to Santo Domingo, Puerto Plata, but I want to do another one here. Uh, and for if anyone doesn't know what this, this is, uh, I get a lot of requests to meet. Hey, I'd love to have coffee. I'd love to meet with you. I'd love for you to, you know, we're going to be in town. Can we take you and your wife to dinner? And it's probably a dozen or so a day which is very humbling, but very overwhelming. So my policy is no, it's like, I, I can't, no, I can't do 15 minute coffees with everybody in the world. It would just, it would, I don't have the time for it. But I was trying to think, well, how do I though meet with people? Cause I do enjoy meeting with people and I actually feel bad saying no. So I'm like, how about I host a mixer, mm -hmm. a happy hour, a get together. And then it's like, well, all right, but everybody could tell me they're going to come and I could set it up at a restaurant or something and then nobody comes. So how do I make people come? make them pay mm -hmm. so but i don't want their money so how do i make them pay you know what even better they have to contribute to a charity that i support so i put uh, kind of the barrier up of if you donate 
I don't know, 25, whatever it is, dollars to this specific charity. It's local. It's called Second Mile Missions, seeking to oh, yeah. end, um, you know of it. I do know of Amazing. it since when they first came. Perfect. So uh, ending poverty and, and human trafficking mm -hmm. in the Dominican Republic. Donate to the charity, and then I'll tell you where we're going to be meeting so I don't publicize where it's going to be and everything. Uh, and it's great. The first one we did in Punta Cana, we raised $4,000, which puts about wow. eight kids through school. Yeah. Incredible. The second one in Santiago we did last weekend, raised about $3,000 just over. So that puts another six kids through school for a year. So I like doing that. I'm going to continue to do these pop-up meetings. Um, and there's been a call for it. To your point about community, there's been a call for uh, doing something like this for the level of people that come to these events. There, there are folks that you know are like, absolutely, I'm going to pay. Like, It's funny. A lot of people are like, oh, why are you putting money in front of us? Like, because I don't want you there. <laughs> like, I, the person that asked that question, that's just not my people here, right? So not that I'm saying money is everything, but if you don't understand the investment of helping a charity, coming to something and meeting other people who think like you, then you're not my people. So these are the folks that I want to come to this. So yeah, I'll do another in Punta Cana and maybe I'll make it a regular thing with the idea of, yeah, how can we, how can we help this charity? How can we get mm -hmm. people together in the area uh, and just have great conversations and exchange numbers and do all of that. So it's a lot of wow, fun. Wow. That's incredible. I would definitely pay the price Good. to contribute. In. the next one. <laughs> great. <laughs> so let's, so that's, that's incredible. And, and I'm really, really happy to hear about that. And I think that's a, a really great idea yeah. so when I asked you earlier if we could go out to coffee then you're an exception <laughs> you're the billboard lady no 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 of course I take <laughs> meetings of course I meet with people well here let me give you a tip not just you but anybody watching a networking tip typically and I've done this we've all done this typically when somebody wants to meet with somebody mm -hmm. that they admire feel they can learn from or whatever the approach is usually and I understand why I've done this too is what can I gain mm -hmm. I would love to sit down with you I love this phrase and pick your brain I'm like, I don't want my brain picked. That sounds right. painful. Like, right, I'd right, rather right. not have my brain picked. But the best approach you can make, and it doesn't mean that the person owes you anything or that they will say yes, but the best approach you can make is an offer of value in exchange mm -hmm. for their time. Mm -hmm. So to go to somebody and say, hey, I noticed you're doing this. I'm part of this organization. Well, like, like Susan, like, hey, I know all these people that I can help you with your podcast mm -hmm. that, you're, that you're putting together. Uh, these restaurants, like, I want, I want to, yeah, that's an offer of value. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely wanting to meet with her if she wanted to. You never asked, but if you did, I would do it. But that's my point. The, the, if you can approach somebody with an offer of value, mm -hmm. there's a better likelihood that person is going to hear or exchange. Well, tell me more about that. What is that? Oh, you know what? Yeah, let's grab coffee. That mm -hmm. interests me. I'd love to get involved with that. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what this is for yes. you and I, right? It's, yeah. a, it's a conversation where there's an exchange of value, not just, hey, give me your time because right. I want it and I want you to teach me and I want to pick your brain. Like, right. It's a lot of, I, I'd love yeah. to if I only had one person ask. Exactly. You know, so. No, I I, t I totally understand. And it, it's so funny because I get the same question a lot. I bet. <laughs> Probably bet. not as much as no. you. No, sure. But uh, Jamie, thank you so much for being a part of the Punta Cana podcast. This is our 20th episode. Woo! -woo! We are a part of the 1% yes. now that that is, uh, and, and I totally understand. I mean, at first when we embarked on this project, you know, it was an idea. Everybody wants to do a podcast. Hey, let's do a podcast. But then, you know, you have equipment, you have team and staff and organization and coordination and editing. And yes. there's so much That's involved in it. I, I read that statistic, like only 1% gets to 20 episodes. And I thought to myself, oh shit, you know, what, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I into? And and here we are. Yeah. So, so happy to have you oh, to be a part of this Thank very yeah. momentous occasion for us here with the Punta Cana podcast to share your story with us uh, about your journey and what you're doing here. Looking forward to more collaborations with you to support and add value to what you're doing and the charities. And so I um, just want to thank you again. Thank you. An honor. Honestly, 20 episodes. Congratulations to you. Oof. So how can people find you? Sure. Instagram. I know you're easy to find. At the Jamie Gruber. Well, I, I'm easy to find because I'm the whitest guy other than <laughs> other than uh, maybe whitest guy in Punta Cana. So just look for a shining light <laughs> off of the sun and you'll see me. Uh, at the Jamie Gruber on Instagram, youtube.com slash at the Jamie Gruber, either or. That's where I spend most of my time with content. So Yes. Thank you so much. And here you have it. Episode number 20 of the Punta Cana podcast. Thank you so much for being a part of our journey. If you have not, please subscribe, add a comment, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you so much. Thank you.